Hey guys, we finally got an action-filled episode of The Rings of Power, but still no shortage of references to deeper lore and things to theorize on in this week's breakdown, not to mention an explosive ending. Before we dive in, if you're a fan of Tolkien's world, new or old, be sure to hit that subscribe button as the Rings of Power coverage is a mere tip of the iceberg when it comes to Middle-earth videos here on Nerd of the Rings. The very first reference we have in this episode is the title itself, Udun. Udun refers to a few things in Tolkien's world. For starters, it's the name of the Deep Valley in the northwest corner of Mordor, just inside the Black Gate. However, long before, it was a second name for Morgoth's first fortress of Utumno. You'll recall back in the premiere episode, I and many others believed, and still do, that the fortress Galadriel's company explores could be the remains of Utumno. More generally, the word Udun is Sindarin Elvish and means Dark Pit, Underworld, or Hell. In all likelihood, the episode title refers to this definition rather than a specific location, as we'll see the first move in Mordor transitioning to the dark pit it will become. The episode opens on Adar's armored glove digging in the soil, where he buries Alfarin seeds, saying, new life in defiance of death. What I noticed here is that he does this in secret. He's behind large roots of a tree hidden from the orcs. We'll see later this is some elven tradition before going into battle, which gave me the sense that as much as Adar talks about being an orc himself, he's obviously slightly clinging to the part of him that was once elven. And again, as we talked about in our premiere breakdown, Alfarin is another name for the symbol Muna, the flower that later grows on the graves outside Edoras. And I won't spoil it here, but on the grave of a notable second age hero of men. Adar stands before his Uruk brethren and gives a rousing speech, within which he drops a couple names, saying they've traveled from the Ered Mithrin to the Ethel Arnen. The Ered Mithrin are the Grey Mountains, north of Greenwood, which is later known as Mirkwood. This mountain range is also notable as the Withered Heath was known as a breeding ground for dragons. The second name, the Ethel Arnen, isn't a term from the Legendarium but I believe I've deciphered its meaning. Ethel is a Sindarin term meaning encircling fence or outer fence, and Arnen is another name for the lands of Athelion. However, since there's no Gondor at this time, the name Athelion would not yet be in use for this area. Thus, Adar is speaking of the lands of Arnen, which shares a border with the lands of Mordor. Adar says for the first time the orcs fight not as slaves but as brothers and sisters in their home. And here we have what I think might be a second Jed Brophy orc who starts the chant of Nampat, which has been confirmed as black speech for death. And in seeing more new orcs, I continue to absolutely love the orc designs Weta did for the series. It's an easy thing to take for granted, but man, there's truly no substitute for these practical effects orcs. They look fantastic. Adar leads the orcs and Waldreg up to the elven tower of Ostirith, where they find it empty. Many fans caught a familiar phrase when an orc captain says Gimbatul. This black speech word is found in the ring verse poem's second line, Aj naj Gimbatul, one ring, to find them. And sure enough, the orc here is ordering his followers to find the people hidden in the tower. After entering, Adar sees the statue depicting the sword and presumably Sauron's helm, which prompts Waldreg to ask what happened to Sauron. And naturally, an orc interrupts before Adar can answer. Adar says he can smell the elf. Again, we see his character to be in an interesting blend of elf and orc, with more to come. A Rondir springs into action, bringing down the entire tower while locking the orcs inside and taking out a number that were still ascending the path. There's not really anything to dissect here, but I'm a big fan of this sequence and it's fun to see a Rondir do awesome elven things as he kind of seems like he's the Legolas of this series. Bronwyn and the villagers see the tower fall from the ground level and begin phase two, preparing their village for an attack by the surviving orcs. Next, we're at sea with the three Numenorean ships. Isildur wakes in the early morning hours, passing by Halbrand who's awake in his hammock. 
Isildur goes to his horse Beric and shares an apple with him before throwing it half-eaten into the water, which is like super wasteful. He totally should have given the rest to the horse. Also, Isildur is a lefty. Galadriel approaches Isildur and she guesses he wants to catch the first glimpse of land, revealing that she has been able to see the land for the past hour. Isildur responds, keen are the eyes of the elves. This is a direct quote from Isildur's descendant, Aragorn. Aragorn says this to Legolas after he counts and describes in detail the riders of Rohan from over five leagues away. Galadriel and Isildur go on to talk about his position of stable sweep and Numenor. Isildur reveals he's trying to get away from the place Numenor has become and questions whether the real Numenor, the one that was faithful, ever existed. Galadriel says it did exist and exists still, if only in the heart of the lowliest stable sweep. Now, I've been pretty critical of Galadriel thus far in this series. And while there's still some things to come that I'm not fond of, I can say this scene was the first I felt like I was getting a glimpse of the actual Galadriel. Her words of humility to Isildur feel a bit reminiscent of similar words she would later speak to Frodo and Sam. And it's these kind of moments I feel the character has been sorely lacking. The show has been so heavily focused on headstrong Galadriel that we haven't seen hardly anything to show us that it is indeed the same person we know from the Third Age. And I'm not by any means saying she has to be exactly the same at this point in the story, but a better balance would be much appreciated. We see a sealed door stare in amazement at the coast of Middle-earth before Elendil interrupts. And before revealing that Isildur's mother died by drowning, he talks about looking east most of his life to see the sunrise over the sea, and west to see it set on land. So basically, seeing it rise over Middle-earth feels backwards to him. This makes me wonder how long he's lived in the east of Numenor for this to be the case. For if he lived in the west of Numenor, the sun would rise above the land of Numenor and set over the sea, as he is currently seeing in this scene. Next, we see Elendil telling Muriel they have a day's sail into the mountains, which should be going up the Anduin River, then a day's ride to Ostirith. Elendil mentions the Vale. This is referring to the pass into Mordor, which will later be known as the Morgul Vale. As we get a closer look at Muriel's map with her magnifying glass, we see Ostirith is situated at this mountain corner. And again, for reference, this here is the end of the mountain range where Minas Tirith will one day be, and the vale they will cross through is directly east of this position. We transition to a Rondir trying to destroy the hilt shard to no avail, so he goes to hide it. The villagers board up and seal all the orc tunnel exits and get their plan in place, including the tavern being where those unable to fight will hunker down. Arondir tells the villagers to do their part and he swears they'll see the sunrise again, which seems like kind of a lot to promise to untrained folks about to face off against orcs. The speech itself is pretty boilerplate, rah rah, let's beat up the bad guys. And it's not dialogue that's like offensively bad or anything, it's more so it just feels like it's lacking any of the poetry we come to expect from Tolkien's world. Theo asks Bronwyn if she remembers what she used to tell him when he had bad dreams. And Bronwyn says, yeah, go back to bed, you little brat. No, I'm just messing with you. What she would tell him and tells him now is, in the end, this shadow is but a small and passing thing. There is light and high beauty forever beyond its reach. Find the light and the shadow will not find you. Now you're probably thinking, wow, that's some dang beautiful dialogue right there. And for good reason. That, my friends, is the mastery of Tolkien at work. You'll probably recognize a small bit from the Peter Jackson films in Sam's monologue at the end of The Two Towers. But this actually comes from the Return of the King book, when Sam sees a star twinkle above the clouds as he and Frodo are in the very lands of Mordor. For like a shaft clear and cold, the thought pierced him that in the end the shadow was only a small and passing thing. There was light and high beauty forever beyond its reach. Theo goes inside to be the last line of defense for those unable to fight, and Bronwyn meets up with Arondir, and he shares with her the tradition of planting Alfarin seeds. Here, Arondir mentions it is tradition to plant one, and we see him give two seeds to Bronwyn, one for each of them, presumably. Bronwyn asks, new life in defiance of death, 
which is the same phrase Adar says, and I immediately wondered why these words would come to her and how she would know this elven phrase. Speaking of Adar, seeing Arondir and Bronwyn plant two seeds makes it noticeable that Adar plants several. I presume that not only is he clinging to his elven origin, but partaking in this tradition on behalf of the Uruks as well. Arondir says after the battle is over, they can settle down and they have some pre-battle smoochy time. Real quick, I'll note that these moments with the Alpharin seeds remind me of one of my favorite scenes from the Hobbit films, which actually ended up on the cutting room floor and didn't even make it into the extended edition. It's a moment where Bilbo buries his acorn in the dirt of Dale, saying it's a promise that there is a chance of new life. When faced with death, what can anyone do but go on living? In this scene, Arondir also references one of the Valar who watches over growing things and those who tend them. This Vala is Yavanna. She is the wife of Aule, who created the dwarves. And she not only helped create the two trees of Valinor, but was also instrumental in Eru deciding to create the Ents. Night falls and the orcs make their way into town. The villagers have a nice trap set up and corner the orcs between lines of fire. The villagers hold their own pretty well, while a Rondir goes 1v1 against this level's boss. We get some good sized one shots in here, which are pretty fun. I'll take a fight scene like this over shaky cam quick cuts any day. Boss Orc has a Rondir pinned and a blade super close to his eye when Bronwyn saves the day. Incidentally, I totally thought Theo was gonna be the one to save him, but it was Bronwyn instead. No smoochy this time because a Rondir got gross Orc blood like all over his mouth just now. The Southlanders think they've won, only for Orondir to realize that many of the orcs were actually the defected Southlanders dressed as orcs. Now I don't think they're all men by any means because on second viewing, I noticed a lot of orc faces in these fights. Now my first thought when seeing this scene was that perhaps Adar truly was Sauron and his power of creating illusions made all these men look like orcs until this moment. It would be a really cool instance of Sauron using this power we know him to have but it doesn't seem like that's what's happening here. Incidentally, in the first age, we see an instance where Galadriel's brother Finrod disguises himself and his company as orcs. So powerful elves are mentioned a couple times doing similar magic. The arrows start flying and Bronwyn is hit. And I thought for sure she was toast, but Theo and Arondir save her using the Alpharin seeds and a fiery piece of wood to cauterize the wound. We check in with the Numenorians who have made it to land and are riding as the sun rises. Now I noted in my live stream that according to a footnote in Unfinished Tales, it does say that the Numenorians didn't use horses in war since all their wars were overseas in Middle-earth. While they had horses in their settlements in Middle-earth, those were typically only used by couriers and archers. And while yes, technically this is a departure from the source material, I think it's a pretty innocuous one in my opinion. Arondir refuses to give Adar the shard, so the orcs start stabbing people. And here we see again, this is definitely a more violent version of Middle-earth. Not necessarily that there's stabbing going on, but just the amount that is shown. We've had orc blood flowing from an eye socket, and now we get a couple extended looks at people getting stabbed in the gut. Now I'm not trying to be a prude, and I know the Game of Thrones crowd will scoff, but this for me toes over the line of what I would expect from a Lord of the Rings show. It's mostly not bloody in these scenes, but it does seem to dwell on these blades going into people's stomachs, and the blood flows from wounds a fair amount in this show. And personally, I'm just not a huge fan of it. Anyway, when Bronwyn is threatened, Theo reveals where the shard is, handing it over to Adar as we hear a thunderous sound in the distance. Adar tells Waldrig he has a task for him, and the Numenorians show up in full force taking on the group of orcs. Side note, we get a good shot of the skins covering the orcs here, and what we have here is dragon skin. As we mentioned earlier, these orcs and Adar come from the Grey Mountains, where dragons were known to have lived. So it looks as though they managed to take one or two down and are using their hide, perhaps the skin from their bellies, to shield themselves from the sun. In the battle, we see some cool moments like Galadriel dodging an arrow and decapitating the archer. We see Isildur's buddies Valandil and Ontimo in the battle, and when Valandil stabs an orc and twists, we get more crazy gushing blood that honestly looks more at home in the Shadow of Mordor games. 
Antimo nearly gets taken out by an orc and we see Isildur is atop the hill with Muriel and he's chomping at the bit to get into the action, so Muriel tells him to go. Elendil gets into some trouble and gets knocked off his horse before being saved by Halbrand throwing a spear at an attacking orc. Real quick, I will say, if Halbrand does turn out to be Sauron, he's saving an awful lot of people that are his enemies in this show. Isildur comes up to Elendil lying on the ground and there definitely seems to be a bit of a parallel between this moment and the moment to come many years down the road when Isildur will come to his father's side as we saw in the Fellowship of the Ring. Galadriel asks Arondir who the orc's commander is and he points out Adar and Galadriel gives chase. During which Galadriel says Norolim to her horse. If this sounds familiar, it's because it's the same phrase Arwen says to Asphaloth when she is pursued by the Ringwraiths in the Fellowship of the Ring film. Halbrand trips the horse Adar commandeered, but we see the horse get up so he's okay. Halbrand stabs Adar in the hand as he reaches for the shard package thing, and Halbrand asks, do you remember me? When Adar says no, Halbrand almost kills him, but Galadriel stops him. Back in the village, Galadriel interrogates Adar talking about elves being taken by Morgoth and tortured into orcs. Very similar to Saruman's speech in The Fellowship of the Ring. She says Adar is one of these elves, the Moriandor, a Quenya word meaning sons of the dark. Galadriel wants to know where Sauron is and threatens to bring the orcs into the sunlight. Adar says after Morgoth's defeat, Sauron devoted himself to healing Middle-earth bringing its ruined lands together in perfect order. The first part I think is a pretty big stretch. The second, however, makes a lot of sense knowing what we do about Sauron. We know that at the end of the first age, Sauron repents to Aonwe for his evil deeds. And in the Silmarillion it says, some hold that this was not at first falsely done. Now it goes on to say that Sauron flees rather than face the judgment of the Valar and from the sounds of it, he falls back into evil fairly soon afterward. The part that makes the most sense here is that Sauron would attempt to put everything in perfect order. For it's his obsession with order that leads him down the path of darkness in the first place. Again, this is a pretty big TBD for me. We'll see how this plays out. It makes sense that perhaps Sauron would contemplate his actions and ways in the early days of the Second Age, but the idea that he's out and about being a good guy would be pushing the villain rehab thing way too far in my personal opinion. Granted, this is all coming from a guy who just made a dude kill a kid last week, so maybe he's not the best judge of what constitutes good and evil. Anyway, Adar says Sauron sought to craft a power not of the flesh, but over flesh. A power of the unseen world. Turns out Sauron took a lot of his orcs to the Northern Fortress and his experiments didn't work to craft whatever it is he sought to craft. A shadow of dark knowledge hidden even from him. During this description, we also see a carving of a Balrog head and various orc skulls. So I think the writing on the wall here is that Sauron sought a way to bring order by bringing people under his sway, and that method will eventually be the Rings of Power. As for the dark knowledge hidden from him, I have a suspicion it will be the power of the magic mithril chlorians we learned about in the last episode. Adar says he sacrificed enough of his children for Sauron and so he split him open. He believes he killed Sauron. Of course, the joke is on Adar because Sauron is a truly immortal being and cannot be wholly killed. Even if his physical form is destroyed, which is what sounds like happened here, it's only a matter of time until Sauron returns. Galadriel and Adar go on to debate the nature of Uruks. Galadriel says they have hearts created by Morgoth, to which Adar responds, they are creations of the One, the master of the secret fire, otherwise known as Eru Iluvatar, the god of Tolkien's created world. Here the show seems to be playing off Tolkien's real world struggle he had later in life with the idea of orcs being irredeemable. The question for me right now is how far they might take this concept. Again, it's a wait and see. Again, Adar probably isn't the best judge of good and evil from what we've seen of him. In response to Adar, Galadriel vows to eradicate every last orc while keeping Adar alive so that he will know all his offspring are dead before she kills him, which is like super dark. 
So dark that our season one bad guy says, perhaps the search for Morgoth's successor should have ended in your own mirror. And let's be honest, from what we've seen, he's not entirely wrong. Galadriel's threat sounds pretty bonkers right after Adar is like, hey, we deserve breath of life and a home. And she's like, how about I kill every last one of you? While I'm not the biggest fan of Galadriel's revenge kick, it is nice that the show is aware that this is not a desirable thing for the Lady of Light and seems to be pointing to her need to change. Halbrand stops Galadriel from killing Adar and we see that Adar had enough of a transformation that his blood is black like the other orcs. He then asks Halbrand who he is, to which Halbrand just walks away. Galadriel and Halbrand thank each other for stopping the killing of Adar. Halbrand starts talking about not feeling he could be free of his past until today, and says how the feeling of fighting by Galadriel's side is something he wants to hold on to, and bind it to his very being, which again gets added to the long list of sauron things that he's said and done. Galadriel says she felt it too, and they kind of look at each other before getting interrupted. Okay, so I've made it no secret that I have zero interest in some Halbrand Galadriel romance thing. Now some folks in the watch party said they didn't read this scene as romantic at all, but instead that they both had a sense of the other's power during their fighting. And perhaps this is the first clue Galadriel might have that Halbrand isn't what he claims to be. So I'm curious to hear what you guys think in the comments. Back in the village, Bronwyn and Muriel exchange pleasantries, and Muriel is like, hey, you want this dude to be your king? And Bronwyn notices his pouch and is like, that's good enough for me and all hail King Halbrand. Galadriel gives the shard to a Rondir, who gives it to Theo so that he could get rid of it and be free of it. But psych, it's just a hatchet. Turns out the errand for Waldreg is to go back to the Downfallen Tower, where he stabs the sword into the base of the monument. This releases the water behind the tower. But before we see where it goes, we cut back to a sealed door who has a wounded Beric who is kind of freaking out. Elendil comes up to Beric and says, Athe, no Ithui he. Which I believe is only our second Sindarin Elvish we've seen in the show. And ironically, both have been in this episode and both spoken to horses. Based on a rough translation, I think he's saying, you long for healing this night, or be healed this night. It's something along those lines. Elendil talks about the bond formed between horse and rider, and that Beric can feel Isildur's pain. He says he learned it from Isildur's mother, and agrees to teach his son. Real quick, Elendil also drops the name Westerness in this conversation, which is the common speech name for Numenor that we see pop up a good amount in The Lord of the Rings. Even though it's just a short scene, I really enjoyed the chance to slow down for just a moment and show a bit of development in the Isildur Elendil relationship. In a pretty action heavy episode, this is actually one of my favorite scenes. The nice father son moment is broken up by a loud rumbling, and all the boarded up tunnel entrances begin to spout water as we see Waldrig's work go into effect. Turns out the orc tunnels were a way for a lake to flow into Orodruin. And as the vast amounts of water flow into the lava, my prediction comes to pass and we have our first eruption of Mount Doom. Balls of fire crash all around and all heck breaks loose as people flee. We get a really cool shot of the huge cloud of smoke, ash, and fire that comes ever closer to the village. As some awesome folks in my watch party live chat pointed out, this is called a pyroclastic flow made of rock fragments, gas, and ash in the aftermath of an eruption. Long story short, it's not something you want to find yourself facing. And just when I thought I was onto something tying this lightning we see to the last image of Sauron when the ring is destroyed, I learned that volcano eruptions can indeed cause lightning within their pyroclastic flow. It's kind of wild stuff and totally worth a Google if you want to check it out. In our last couple shots, aside from people running, we see Adar has escaped the barn before it's destroyed and Galadriel closes her eyes, seeming to accept whatever fate may come as we cut to black and roll credits. We're down to just two episodes left of this first season of Rings of Power, and it seems like next week we'll be checking back in with The Stranger and Casa Doom. I thought it was really nice to be following a single storyline for the entire episode this week, and this episode definitely brought some much needed action and conflict to the table. 
That being said, I'm always eager to see more of Durin, Elrond, and Khazad Doom, so I'm very much looking forward to going back to the Dwarven Realm next week. As always, I want to say a huge thank you to my Patreon supporters who make this channel possible. Tom DeBombadil19, Listen Me the Cinda, Kella Brimbor, The Mighty Mim, Team Weasel, Rabbi Rob Thomas, Charles Leisure, Toby Mobs Music, CCDC Red Team, Sky Carcass, Slide Belts, Dane Ragnarsson, Salim Rahman, Zetrock, Berto Berg, Grand Strategy Nerd, Graham Derricott, The Dark Haired One, Wyland, Michael Wu, and Debbie. If you enjoyed the artwork in this video, check out the artists in the description and purchase prints of their great work for yourself. Thanks so much for watching and subscribing, and we'll see you next time on Nerd of the Rings.